to title it, but I think that provides uh, kind of the middle ground in regards to what we're going to look at. Obviously, when you think about a soldier, you think about a battle, you think about a war, you think about a fight. And um, there's a lot that has to go into that, weapons and armor and tactics and devices and uh, knowing the enemy, all those kind of things. And so um, that is what we're going to be looking at. And I tell this first lesson, the call to service, the call to service. Uh, as I said, there's, there's much to consider when we think about being a soldier. Obviously, we think about it in a carnal way in regards to uh, the military and all those kind of things. There's, there's tactics and strategies. There's intelligence. There's the fights and the tactics and the, the methods of fighting, the skirmishes, battles. You think about war. You think about your ability to war. You're not going to enter a war. You're not going to enter a fight if you don't have the capacity to really fight. We see that even in the Old Testament. We just see people who can't fight. They just submit. They just do what they uh, think is best. Instead of having their lives taken, uh, they'll give their lives in a different way. Uh, when we think about war and we think about, again, uh, intelligence and, and counsel, uh, we think about, again, those that have that uh, data and that information, uh, their perspective, their counsel to be able to go to war. Uh, when you fight, when you go to war, you've got to know your enemy. You recognize and identify strongholds, their devices, their tactics, their wiles. Uh, you recognize what you have at your disposal, your armament, your weaponry, um, what you have to go to battle. But you also got to understand the nature of the fight, what kind of fight. We hear a lot of things in regards to fights and battles now. We call it cyber warfare and uh, not just your typical uh, uh, ordinary warfare. Uh, now there's cyber warfare. So we got to know what kind of fight uh, we're engaged in. What's the nature of the fight? And then you look at possible outcomes and you, again, strategize in regards to taking a, a, a stronghold and, and what you're going to do after that and, and your advancements. And so we're going to be taking a look at a lot of these things throughout this series of study. Of course, as this is lesson number one, this is going to be very foundational. And so we're going to take a look at two things. One, the reality that there is a fight. Oftentimes, many Christians think, well, there's no fight to be fought. There's nothing that we are to engage in. That's anti-Christian to fight. And so we need to see the reality that there is a fight. And we'll do that before we actually look at the nature of the fight. But there is a fight. And then secondarily, we'll look at tonight is the issue of the, the call to service, the call to service, and uh, that we are soldiers of Jesus Christ and, and how that can be and how that is. Let's get started here. I know I read Ephesians chapter 6. That's going to be our base text, our theme text for this series of studies. But come with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse 6 with me. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse 6. This is Paul's last letter that he writes, last epistle. He writes it to his son in the faith. And uh, there's some great things in here in regards to fighting and the, and the battle, both this epistle as well as his first epistle that he writes to Timothy. And um, these are some of his last words that the Apostle Paul writes. And I think it gives us some very clear perspective of the reality that there is a fight to be fought. If we look at verse 6, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Uh, that was three verses that were to impact the, uh, Timothy, the son in the faith, to do what his father in the faith had done. And it's particularly what I wanted to look at is verse 7 there when he says, I have fought a good fight. He's fought a good fight. Uh, it's very telling, one, that Paul's at the end of his fighting, but that he's fought. Uh, he's done this throughout his life. He's done this especially when he was justified there on the road to Damascus and when he was 
when he received apostleship, grace and apostleship for obedience of the faith among all nations. And he fought. He fought a fight. Secondarily, we see here not only did the Apostle Paul fight, but we begin to see a, a good fight. Not just any fight. Uh, in fact, if you uh, come back with me to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, we see that the Apostle Paul, before he entered into the good fight, uh, he did fight, but it was the wrong battle. It was the wrong fight. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and look at verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before. So we see what Christ has done and his enabling of Paul and putting him into the ministry. But now he's talking about what happened prior to that, what was before. He says, who was before a blasphemer and a what? Persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was a, a blasphemer that led to being a, a persecutor and injurious. He fought all right. And he engaged in a, in a physical fight against those that were trusting that Jesus was the Christ. But his fight, uh, the fighting didn't end. It was just a different kind of fight. We go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we realize there again in verse 7, he says, I have fought a good fight, a good fight. And so as we go along and talk about the nature of this fight, eventually we need to recognize first and foremost that there is a, a good fight and there is a bad fight. There is a, a proper fight and an improper fight. Nonetheless, there is a fight. There is a fight. Come with me, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And come down to verse 12. Where Paul says, I have fought the good fight of faith, he now tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, he charges Timothy to fight this fight. He says in verse, in fact, let's look at verse 11. He says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Flee, follow, and now in verse 12 he says, fight. Flee, follow, fight the good fight of faith. We begin to see again the nature of that fight. It's the fight of faith. He says, lay hold on eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith. We see in these passages the reality that there is a fight. Come back over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse 1. All I'm trying to establish again is to recognize that there is a fight to be fought, to battle and to engage in. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be soldier. Uh, we see in this text to be strong. Uh, we see the issue of endure hardness. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And the issue of warring and, and how we are to war there in verse 5. Those aren't the only passages, however, is just what Paul writes to Timothy. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and look at verse 1 with me. Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I, have, when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, 
which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And then he goes on to describe this war. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and, have, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Uh, we see words like war, weapons, warfare, mighty, strongholds, captivity, revenge. These are all words that describe the fight, that describe the war. Of course, we read already Ephesians chapter 6, but look over in Ephesians chapter 6, all to further substantiate the reality that there is a fight. There's a fight that we need to be engaged in, and we need to know exactly the nature of the fight. We need to know our enemy. We need to know God's provision of armor, His exhortation, His strength, His might, what that all is, and be able to then engage in the battle and function as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Again, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, and then he goes on and he lists the nature of the armor, and the, the, the whole armor, talking about the loins girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and what goes along with that is the issue of prayer as well. So another text that we begin to see that there's a battle, that there's a fight. Come with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and let's look at verse 27. Here we begin to see that there's, again, adversaries that we have. We have enemies. Verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. We see the issue of terror, we see adversaries, and we see conflict and suffering. The issue of standing fast, striving together, those are all things that involve the issue of a fight, an issue of a war. Look at chapter 3 of Philippians. It'll be our last one to substantiate the reality that there is a fight. Just the very simple fact that there is a fight. Philippians chapter 3, and look at verse 18, if you will. Uh, verse 17, verse 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the, what? Enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. There's another word that you think about when you think about the issue of a battle or a fight and, and having dominion and, and going against adversaries is the issue of subduing them, subduing them. And so again, we can see that there is a fight to be fought, uh, the good fight, 
a good warfare and being good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Well, how do we enter into this service? How do we enter into this fight? What is the, the call to service? Well, the call to service into the fight, the war, the warfare, is part of our overall service to God. It's part of our overall service to God. That we became servants of God, we became His sons and daughters in this life, and that understanding gives context to the fight, to the war. So come back with, you, with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is a, a very uh, pivotal point in the book of Romans where he begins to describe the nature of what God did on our behalf to be his. That we are bought with a price and in view of us being bought with a price, we have now been come to him. We, uh, we are his, we belong to him. We're his possession. We're his servants. And that took place by a spiritual baptism. And so if we look at Romans chapter 6, and you look at verse 16, he says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Uh, we were the servants of sin, not simply by our obedience to sin, but by Adam's obedience to sin. And we were sin's servants by our obedience as well to sin. But that all changed the moment we believed in what Christ did for us. We became servants of God. And by our, our obedience of faith from the heart, we became servants to God. And that's a drastic change. Uh, that is a radical change. And what I want you to understand is that our salvation is so drastic when we think about it in the context of a fight, a war, and a battle, that the nature of our salvation, the nature of our justification, and this spiritual baptism immediately takes us from being enemies of God, at enmity with God, and it turns us into soldiers of Jesus Christ. We go from being enemies to soldiers of Jesus Christ behind enemy lines. We become, we were once servants to sin, and we're going to see servants of the adversary, sons and daughters of Satan, and we're so drastically saved and changed that we're become sons and daughters of God, and we become ambassadors of our Father, ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, ambassadors of our King. Ownership has taken place, a transfer of identification has taken place from sin and Satan and this world to this issue of God, who is our Father, Christ is our King, and now the world in which we live, we are strangers and pilgrims on, and so we are therefore really in enemy territory. That is what begins to frame out the context of the reality of the fight, is the simple operation, not simple to us, simple to God, operation of what he did the moment we believe, that changed us from no longer being in Adam under the dominion and authority of sin and Satan, to being under the dominion and authority of God, our Savior, but yet we still live in this world. We still live in this world. If you look at Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, you know the verse well, but look at verse 8. Uh, we'll back it up to verse 6. He says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. We go from being the ungodly to this issue of becoming godly in Christ Jesus by virtue of justification. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. We weren't righteous. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. We weren't even good. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were sinners. 
He goes on in verse 9, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Then he goes on in verse 10, for if when we were what? Enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. He changes us from being enemies to being reconciled and the, the benefits of that reconciliation as it is individually taking place. But we never change the issue of our position. We never change our ground. We're we're on this earth. But more has even taken place than just that. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Actually, make it Ephesians 2. We see that we are under the dominion of sin, and we are enemies of God in view of that. But the adversary, God's adversary, took advantage of that situation and we followed suit. And we were saved from that as well. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 1. And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Now look at verse 2. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. What is such the drastic salvation that we have? Verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And though, although spiritually we are raised up together and we are made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, we are still physically on this earth. We're still physically on this earth. And therefore, the ones who we were among before, we are still among. Our conversation necessarily isn't as it was in times past. However, we're still among those children of disobedience, those children of wrath. So what makes the fight go to a physical fight for Paul to a spiritual fight is again the the drastic, radical salvation and justification that he has of being placed into Christ, not taken out of this world, and therefore he is not of the world, and therefore it frames the context of the fight, the fight. So our call to service is in the overall context of our service to God, our context of our service to God. Since we're already here in Ephesians, come with me to Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. And come down, if you will, I'm sorry, I want chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is more fitting to what I wanted to look at. Let's pick it up here in verse 6. Ephesians 5, verse 6, he says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, the whoremongering, the idolatry, the filthiness, the foolish talking, the jesting, the covetousness, the uncleanness, the fornication, all those things he made mention of in verses 3, 4, and 5. He now says, Because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience, the ones in whom we walked among as unbelievers, the ones in whom we live among, Now, see, the tendency is to think, oh, there's not going to be any wrath that's going to happen. God's not looking. God doesn't care. These things are just going to keep happening, and nothing ever happens. Justice is never served. We're always waiting and anticipating some wonderful revolution of truth and light and all these kind of things, when the reality is what we wait for is not some kind of victory in this life. We wait for a greater victory. The reality of what Scripture teaches is for us Christians here on this earth, we lose. We lose. 
you can find great comfort in the clarity of Scripture in the reality as Christians we lose in the perspective of the world. But we win the eternal fight. We gain eternally so much greater. And that produces the peace, that produces the endurance when we lose the physical fight, when we lose the fight on this earth. You don't have to go very far in the scriptures to realize that. You just read your apostle and you realize that in the world's eyes and the world's standards, we lose, but we win, we gain, we can try it, we have victory, but it's in Christ. And so the natural tendency in his thinking is, oh, the wrath of God is going to come upon these children of disobedience. They get along, they, they've been getting away with it for years and years and years. But God's taking account, and he will. And so he says, let no man deceive you with vain words. Don't think that God doesn't care and God's not looking. He says, for because of these things, the very things that we think that they're getting away with, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And so he then says in verse 7, be not ye therefore partakers with them. The wrath is coming upon them because of these things. Don't get caught up in them as if God doesn't care. His wrath is coming upon those things. So don't be partakers with them. He goes on in verse 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We didn't just walk in darkness. We were darkness. We were darkness. Uh, darkness in the Scripture, you obviously have the, the, the issue of the absence of light, of you know, what, we, what we see, that kind of light. But the other way in which we're supposed to understand light and darkness is the issue of truth and error. That's all we had. We didn't, we didn't have the Scriptures. We didn't have the, the Bible. We didn't have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We were rejecting that. We were blinded to that. We, we adopted what we hear in the news and on the radio, what we learn in our schools. And we'll be blessed to have Christian parents, but for many, they don't have Christian parents, and so you're taught what your parents teach you. They have no biblical grounds. And there's a smorgasbord of the wisdom of this world that gets, uh, uh, that gets placed in the, the, the unbeliever, gets placed in the individual that just comprises the individual to be darkness itself, and all it can propagate it's further darkness. You know this now as Christians. And even when you talk to some other Christians, you realize some of the darkness that's still in there. There's a whole other Christian darkness that is perceived as light, but is error. It's not according to sound doctrine. And the adversary goes to great lengths and works that way. I mean, think about it. There is one way. There is the truth, right, that we find in the Scriptures all the adversary has to do is have a competing authority or authorities. All he's got to do is change God's word, add to God's word, take away God's word, right? Get you to interpret God's word uh, improperly. And so it's no wonder why there's so much darkness. But oh, that light, when you see that light, how glorious it is. But you go, you start, you start talking to people in their their, their thought of life and death and what they're here for and all these kind of things. And you think, these people are insane. They're crazy. It's because they are. They're darkness. You get in all this new age mysticism, all these kind of things, and, and incarn uh, reincarnation, all these kind of things. It's just absolutely bonkers. Because of the darkness that's in. And we were once that. We once had those. Maybe not so radical as some, but radical in comparison to the light. Enough to recognize that we were sometimes darkness. But the moment we trust the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, in that gospel of Jesus Christ, you've now become light. There's other darkness that there's still have to deal with but that is enough light to identify you as light. 
It's not our light. It's His light. But now are ye light, here it is, in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He's describing the battle. He's describing part of the fight. And it's wrapped up in our overall call to service in regards to our obedience to God, our obedience to Christ, our walking after the Spirit by minding the things of the Spirit in God's Word. And we're no longer darkness. We are light in the Lord, and we're to walk as children of light, but because we're in the darkness, we're among the darkness, there's a fight. There's a fight. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And look again at the drastic translation the moment we believe that takes place that again begins to, if we, we perceive it, begins to frame out the context of our call to service when it comes to the fight. Colossians chapter 1, come down to verse 12. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. We belong to another kingdom. Our citizenship is in a whole other kingdom. It's part of our identity. We are not a part of the kingdom of this world. And this wasn't only true in regards to the church, the body of Christ. This is true of all those that belong in Christ. Whether it's Israel, the little flock, who's going to have, they're going to be a part of the kingdom on this earth, or whether it's the church, the body of Christ, who are going to be a part of the heavenly kingdom, it's all going to be gathered together in one in Christ Jesus. And that is what we are of. That's what we are a part of. That's what we're looking forward to. That's our home. That's our destination. That's the outcome. But right now there's a fight. And there's a fight between that kingdom of God and the things that pertain to that kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. And we are among those kingdoms of this world. And we should expect nothing different than evil and darkness to come forth from them. Even the best of them, listen, even, even the ones that we consider good in some moral, right? Some of the good pre past presidents, if they're not Christians, they're darkness. There's no in-between. There's no gray when it comes to the issue of light and darkness in the scriptures. They are either believers or they're working for the adversary. They might have done some wonderful good things that would, we would even say, well, those things kind of line up with Scripture. Sure, that you can be thankful for it, but you better be careful of that individual and how you esteem them in your mind or her in your mind. You begin to follow that. You begin to hear that. You begin to incline your ear to what they're saying instead of what your Father is saying in the Word of God, and you get caught up in it. And you've got to realize that this is not your home. This is not your home. Come with me to John's Gospel. I want us to look at a couple passages here and then wrap up the issue of our call to service in regards to the overall context of our reasonable service that we are to have with unto our Father. But look at uh, John. Let's start here in chapter 15. John's Gospel, chapter 15, and look at verse 19. This kind of builds. As you get here, verse 15, 16, 17, and 18. Now look at verse 16 here. 
He's speaking to his apostles, his disciples. He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of my Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Beautiful logic. You're not of the world. Why? Because I've chosen you out of the world. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But because I've chosen you out of the world, and you're not of the world, the world's going to hate you like they hated me because I'm not of the world. <coughs> See it again here in chapter 16. Look at chapter 16 and verse 33. Great clarity here that the Lord gives and great clarity we have in Paul's epistles as well. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. Where do they have the peace? In Christ. In the world ye shall have tribulation. There's no, well, are you sure about that? I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't think so. You know? No, in the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Our victory is not in small reprieves of morality. Our victory is in the fact that Christ has overcome the world. Think about it when we put so much of a... And listen, I'm guilty as probably anyone, if not even more can get so wrapped up in the, the reprieves of, of, of the world's saviors. When they overcome and, and triumphantly overcome a, a policy or, a, or whatever it might be, or, or a country, that yes, we can in one sense maybe cheer those things on, but not to this good cheer. He has overcome the world. That's what we wait for. That's what we're expecting. That's what we're longing for. That's what we get wrapped up in. The greater battle. The greater battle. And listen, the adversary will utilize those things in the fight because the fight is the fight of faith and get you caught up in those things so that you're not engaging in the battle. He's very crafty. Look at another one. Look at chapter 17. John chapter 17, look at verse 14. Here he's praying to the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ is. He says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. See what he prays? Pray, don't take them out, Father. Just keep them. Keep them. Well, how is he going to keep us? His word. His word. And the whole armor of God and all the other things that he gives us. He goes on in verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He's going to be able to use the evil to his advantage. He's going to be able to use the world to his advantage with the truth to sanctify us, to bring about glorious change. It's this, it's this paradox that is so beguiling to the world, but when you, take, when you take gold that has dross over it and, and you apply the fire, it's purified. And that's what the fight can do to us. It can purify us. It can sanctify us. Come with me to Romans chapter... Oh, one more. Look at, look at John chapter 18. This is the Lord's own profession and confession. 
John 18, and let's look at verse 35. John 18, verse 35. He says, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? So he's before the Jews and the Gentiles, now specifically Pilate. He says, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? The issue of there, am I a Jew, is he is in a greater authority than the Jews. He's the, he is the, he's the Gentiles over the Jews. The Lord responds, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my, what? Servants. My servants would fight. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight. Well, Peter thought his kingdom was of this world. He went to go fight, chopped off the high priest officer's ear. The Lord says, no, Peter, that's not the fight. Puts his ear back on the guy, heals him. He says, you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. What an important lesson for Peter. Come on, Lord, this is your kingdom. This is your time. Listen, you, you, got them, you got them right here. You can just start taking them out. You can just call down the legions of angels. Just go get them. Not yet. Not yet. He will do that, but not yet. The question is, does he do that now? There's many Christians think that what it means to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ is to take our swords, our modern-day swords, and we fight that way. And he says, not yet. It's a different kind of fight. That fight is left for him. Isaiah, when he sees Christ coming from the south, who is this that cometh forth from Basra? Who, who is alone and his garments dipped in blood? as if he was the one who treadeth in the winepress alone. He's going to fight. That's, he's going to do it. How arrogant of us to think that we could overcome the world that way. That's why in 2 Thessalonians, it's the issue of in that day, we'll admire him. Because he's the only righteous one to pour out his vengeance in his fury against his enemies. He'll do that. And so he's teaching him an important lesson. From this point until his return, they're not to fight. He says, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. My kingdom's not from hence. He goes on to explain that in the next verse, verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. In other words, I said, yeah, You're right. I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And he just tells you what his kingdom's about and what the nature of the fight is about. It's about truth. It's about truth. And I, listen, I'm not just talking about worldly truth that you can identify when there's a court case and you're trying to figure out who's lying and who's not lying. That's not the kind of truth we're talking about. We're talking about God's truth, the word of truth that gives perspective and context to all of those situations and circumstances. In other words, you can have someone in a courtroom who is right and the other person's wrong, one's the criminal, one's the victim, and there's a, a, the, the right declaration and judgment being made, and yet the person that is the victim is still a sinner going to hell if they haven't believed the gospel. That's the kind of truth we're talking about. 
that sure, in one sense, you need that, and you need to make judgments, and, you, and, and, and we want to have that kind of morality and that kind of righteousness in a nation, in a country, and between people. But that is not the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. And it all frames out our understanding of the fight and the issue of our call to service. Come with me to Romans chapter 12. After we learn in the book of Romans that we have become servants to God, we're no longer servants to sin. And therefore, if we belong to God, we no longer belong to Satan. And we saw verses to reflect that in Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4, Colossians chapter 1. We begin to realize that this fighting, this war, again, is in the overall context of service, and we're called to serve. We're called to serve God. We are His servants, and we are to serve, right? Ephesians chapter 2, we're not saved, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Lest any man should boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Those works ordained before the foundation of the world were created in Christ unto good works as his servants to do these good works. And these good works before the world began are not of the world. And because we're not of the world and the works are not of the world, that when they're done in the world, there's a fight. It's light and darkness. Servants of God and servants of the adversary. Between the enemies of God and the citizens of his kingdom. So we see here in Romans chapter 12, in view of all the doctrine that is learned in the book of Romans, of what God did to you the moment that you believe the gospel, and what he's calling us unto in regards to what the Spirit's leading, he says in Chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. And he goes down through chapter 12 and he goes down through chapter 13 and he gives you the renewing of your mind. He gives you that light that is in contrast to the darkness of this world. He gives you the instruction of those good works that were ordained before the foundation of the world that is reflective of the love between the Godhead that you're supposed to be putting on display even to your enemies. And when you're confronted by your enemies and all those kind of things, you begin to realize more and more that there's a battle. So you get down to chapter, look at chapter 12, and look at verse 17. He says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life, then you live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. There's the fight. There's the fight of faith. Fighting not to fight. Having God's word so built up in you that you use it as a weapon to not do a carnal fight. And fighting to go on to this. Verse 20, Therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome. See the terms of war? Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You get to chapter 13, and he brings up the terminology again. Look at verse 11. It says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. That's the salvation, the redemption of our body when we'll be with him forever. It says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. It's the issue of a, a, a fight of light and darkness. And the issue is 
prior to this context, all that renewing of the mind is light. It's truth. It's the wisdom of God, and it's not the wisdom of this world. And then the more you get that in you, and the more you put that on display, the, that light shines, your profiting appears. It's made known. Your faith is heard. It's being spoken of. You're being fruitful. But to who? In your service to God, and you're doing this behind enemy lines as you get in contact with those enemies that you once were an enemy of God, those people that you're among, and your light hits their darkness. God's light hits their darkness through you. And, and His goodness in you begins to hit that evil. And there's a great clash that goes on. And so our call to service is part of our overall call, our service with God is our overall call to serve God. Our call to fight, our call to war, our call to be a soldier is part and parcel of our overall call to serving God. In other words, as we serve God, we're going to engage in a fight and He prepares us for it. And He uses it in our service to Him. So I want to end here just by going to a couple of those verses that we looked at earlier and just show you, again, the issue that we're chosen to be a soldier. Come back with me to 2 Timothy Second Timothy chapter 2. And let's just pick it up here in verse 3. He says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath what? Chosen him to be a soldier. That's what he's done. When we believe the gospel, we have been chosen to be a soldier. The issue is, not that we're a soldier or not. The issue is, are you a good soldier? Do you endure hardness? Are you strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? Are you entangling yourself with the affairs of this life or are you pleasing Him who hath called, chosen you to be a soldier? And those are all things we'll deal with more as we go on. Look at what he says here back at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 and then we'll end. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 12 Paul's charge to Timothy fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. See how this is not lay hold on this life. Not try to get everything you can get out of this life. Lay hold on eternal life. That, that's involved in the fight of faith. But then look what he says after that. He says, whereunto thou art also, what? Called. You're called to lay hold on eternal life. You're called to fight the good fight of faith. And I'm going to end by just giving you some wonderful reality in regards to the fight. When we think about this fight, when we think about this war in regards to the resurrection, we already know the outcome. We're, we're standing on high ground. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, he says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And isn't that exactly how Paul ended his epistle to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, where we saw there, uh, where he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, 
there is laid up a crown of righteousness for me, whom the, the, the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and to all them that love his appearing. That's why you want to labor in the Lord. That's why you want to function as a good soldier. Because he's going to decorate and honor you. Not with something that you deserve in and of yourself. Right? A soldier who, who is decorated for honor and service is humbled by such an honor because they recognize that there was much training and boot camp and provision and there's others in their company and there's, there's weapons that they were trained on and, and all these kind of things to save an individual or do a great feat in a battle or a war. They're, they're, they're humbled by that honor because although they're being recognized, that recognition is dependent upon so many other things. They're just one link in the chain of provision. Nonetheless, there's honor and decoration, and so too is Christ going to honor and decorate us to further humble us in recognition of our, we're just one link in the chain of all of his provision. And when we fought a good warfare, we fought the good fight, and we function as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, that that was not in vain. It was not in vain. And that victory, that victory that we already have is going to be so glorious and so triumphant that he'll honor and decorate all those that love his appearing. All those that fight the good fight of faith. Who love him and love his appearing and what he came to do. His, 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 uh, his appearing, the, the issue of when he, when he came and he sacrificed himself. And when he revealed all the truth of that to the Apostle Paul, so the truth of that could permeate our minds and our souls, our minds and our hearts to be like him, to be a good soldier of who? Jesus Christ. He's our commander in chief, he's our general. He gives the marching orders, and we follow as his soldiers. We follow his example. Well, we have so much more to look at, but hopefully this substantiated as we've gone through these verses, the reality that there is a fight, and understanding that our call to service is wrapped up into our overall call to serve God. And as such, because we're left on this earth and we learn light, amongst darkness, and we learn goodness amongst evil, that there is a battle, there is a fight that we'll find ourselves in. But oh, has he equipped us. And we'll look at that in lessons to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word. The battle rages on, yet so often we don't know as Christians, one, that there is a fight, the nature of the fight. We don't recognize our call to serve in this fight. And we get so wrapped up in the affairs of this life. And we end up pleasing the prince of the power of the air and the prince of this world as we engage in what he is doing on this earth. And he's got so many tactics. He's got so many wiles to get us caught up in. And yet we have the light. We have your instruction. We have your marching orders. We need to realize that that is the greatest fight to ever be a part of. There is great provision you've given us to fight this fight. And that it is no small thing when we look at simply sharing the gospel that is oftentimes not something simple to do because we want to be eloquent in our speech and we want to be pleasing and favorable in the eyes of our beholder that we end up not sharing the gospel, but there's where the fight is. To go into enemy lines and to share the gospel with our enemies so that they can become soldiers of Jesus Christ. What a message we have. That will pull the people out of the deadness of their sins and quicken, 
quicken their spirit. That's the message that we have. That's the sword that we wield. And Father, so often, and I confess to you, so often we look at it as such, such an insignificant thing that the battle really is in politics, in government, in military strongholds, and military weaponry. And yet to get our eyes on that would be to entangle ourselves in the affairs of this life. The reality is all those military soldiers, all the people in government, they need to hear a message, and that is of your, of your saving grace in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And after that, to com- continually confront that darkness that is in the world with the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, may we be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. May we put our armor on and fight. I give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.